Johnny Jones has never been afraid to stand up for what he believes in. He fought in the D-Day invasion at Normandy and came home to fight against racism and discrimination. He grew up in Laurel Hill, Louisiana on a farm, but his parents knew farming was not going to be their son Johnny's calling. Mrs. Jones told everyone her son was going to be a lawyer. One of his first jobs was in a sawmill. How to look at a log and, very, and, and evaluate how many feet, bows, feet of bows was in that log. And when my daddy came from Woodville and saw that I was doing all of that, instead of just cleaning the office and keeping things dusted, he said, you can do all this? I, I said, yeah, dad, I do it every day. And instead of being just, in, just a, a little giant, somebody that's sleep up sweeping, uh, John, uh, Jonathan, he said, well, then, when Saturday come and you get that when you get that little seven dollars a week check, you go into Southern University, to the Southern University. And so from that time on, I moved on. He attended the Southern Demonstration School and later Southern University. He was drafted in 1942 and became the Army's first black warrant officer. He was in the 5th Engineering 494th Port Battalion that landed at Normandy on D-Day. I went in on D-1 and third, third way. The ship was named Francis C. Harrington. That was the name of the boat, the, the ship that we was on when we were growing up. Jones suffered a hip injury and had shrapnel wounds when his ship was attacked. After the war, he drove to New Orleans to seek treatment and was pulled over and beaten by a white police officer. Fresh out of law school, Jones was tapped by Reverend T.J. Jemison to represent the Urban Defense League in his protest of the mistreatment of black patrons on city buses. Just 15 days out of law school, Jones was providing legal representation in a protest that would reverberate far beyond Baton Rouge. Martha White and Floyd and, 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 and Poole and another woman sat on, on the front of the bus and the bus driver told them they had to move and they would not. After that, they went to court. They, they, they put them in jail and they put, put them in jail and I represent, I represent the civil rights movement. I represent the bus, 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 bus boycott. So there were 17 members of the United Defense League. And over that seven, I, I became the attorney for the United Defense League. You, you got on the bus and sat on one of those, up, up on the front seat. You had to go to the back of the bus. You couldn't sit in the front seat of the bus. When you, if you got on a white man, a white person got on a bus, and one white get on that bus at the front of the bus by the driver, pay, pay, pay the fare, and move to the back of the bus, and sit back at the back of the bus, seat the seat that go all the way across the back. 59 other passengers would get, could pay the fare, but they couldn't sit down. The boycott by black citizens forced the city to make changes. It would become the template for the now famous Montgomery boycott but many thought the struggle ended too soon and more could have been achieved. But in the 60s, people tabooed the civil rights movement. They were afraid. Anybody told them in, in, in the top leadership of the opposite race that that was right. We always had to rely on our own people to support us and to back us. So that made it worse because we had two struggles at the same time. Bring our own people up forward while at the same time pushing the other uh, away. So we was uh, resisting the past and the present. Sixteen came down from Southern University and sat down up at, at Chris and at Sidman which was a leaky drugstore and all of that, and the Greyhound bus station, 16 of them, 
sat down and they didn't move. They sat there and they spoke loud that we're not going to move because separate but equal is a constitution. This is, is unconstitutional. Separate but equal is unconstitutional. And when that happened, change, change took place. The students were arrested for disturbing the peace. Attorney Jones and A.P. Tarot appealed the case to the U.S. Supreme Court, which overturned the students' convictions. Rights guaranteed by the Constitution is none bifurcated. You can't, you can't, you can't have a, a, a constitution made a distinction between citizens, and at the same time saying all men are created equal and then endowed with certain inalienable rights. But the rights of the people to protest were tested again in 1972, with a deadly outcome. There was a demonstration between the cafeteria, cafe, and the academic building. They would line up straight in front of there to make a march. The policemen came in and, and told them not to First to march up because it, they were marching people. And the, the sheriff came and told him they had to break up the march. And they, they continued to march. Police officers had no business. Had no business to have loaded guns for people moving peacefully. Jones was involved in the investigation following the deaths of two students that day, Denver Smith and Leonard Brown. Jones' work to provide full access to public facilities continued with lawsuits to open public pools and later Funfair Park. That's news to me. The result was that his life was often in jeopardy. Three automobiles blowing up under me. Two, one of them in my office, I turned the key on and it flew up in the air, just like, just like a plane would take off. And when it, and when, when it flew up in, when it flew up in the air, being, being a veteran, I knew how to jump. I jumped with, I jumped, I, I jumped out the car on the side. They had witnesses to that down at, at where my office was, down on 13 in government, which is Eddie Robinson in government now. And I, I jumped out and landed on my hip. And my same thing, hurt that I got it in the numbing invasion on D1. In spite of all the threats to his life and his tireless pursuit of justice of equal rights, Jones has advice for us all. To the young generation, the generation of today, far in the generation of, of civil rights movement back in the 60s, they took, your, you, they took the young people too long to catch on or to understand what the civil rights movement was all about. But today, they, they seem to know what it's about. And that's based on education. Our education was so deprived, lacked the proper education to go forward and to think on your own. You always listen to someone to tell you what to do and how to do it. When we ourselves, people of color, black folks, should know that that head was put on their body and above their shoulder to think for themselves.
even though I talk about 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 it, I, it this is the best country in the world. I'm looking to be here, but but the Lord bless me. <laughs>